guys and welcome to episode two of Curiosities of the Natural History Museum and I'm here in the wonderful fossil way. Now this huge hall is loaded with floor to ceiling specimens of incredible marine reptiles, many of which were found by a lady called Mary Anning and her brother and father I believed helped. So Mary Anning was a pioneering paleontologist of her time, so she was the first professional fossil hunter. So her work is still studied today and the specimens she's found are still on display. But she did this in a time that was unheard of. So little, like women had little to no education in that time, let alone ran their own business. Mary Anning did all of that, even with everything up against her. So a lot of the time her specimens were sold off to male scientists. She wasn't given credit for what she found, but she was an amazing scientist herself who kept record and note of all of these discoveries. And we can still see that work today. So these two specimens are of ichthyosaurs of the species Temnodontosaurus. Now this one in particular was found by Mary Anning and her brother in the early 19th century. So it's about a meter long skull and it shows you just how large these creatures could get to. So this is just the jaw, and I mean, if you look at it, they are razor sharp teeth that resemble that of fish and lizards, and that's how they actually get their name ichthyosaur. It translates literally to fish lizard. And if we move on to this eye area, it almost looks like a pineapple slice, but what's amazing about this is it's the largest eye of any predator out there. And around the eye is these bony plates. And what that allows is for the ichthyosaur to still be able to see very well in extreme depth and also darkness. So this is a very kind of scary but amazing part of this predator. And if we then go along, we can see some of the neck bones and vertebrae, and you can get an idea of just how large this creature was swimming around in the Jurassic seas. skull being a meter long suggests that the entire creature would have been over 10 meters and that doesn't necessarily mean that's how big all of them were they could have been even larger than that now this specimen in particular was sold to a gentleman called Mr. Henley um, and then he very kindly gave it to the Bullocks Museum it was later auctioned to the British Museum and then it miraculously got lost and suddenly turned up here when the South Kensington Natural History Museum opened up its stores in 1881 but as you can see it's very safely on display and well looked after so I'm glad it was finally found so this specimen in particular actually confused a lot of scientists and paleontologists at the time so Mary Anning even though she found it with her brother they weren't included in the talks here so these scientists were, who were looking at it almost thought it was fake because they just couldn't understand how it could be part fish part lizard and eventually it got the name ichthyosaur because of just that but it was something completely new and these were one of the first ever complete ichthyosaurs found so this is one orientation of the fossil and obviously fossils don't always die in the exact same way and they can move after they you know fall to the base of the seafloor so if we come up here we can see another orientation of this ichthyosaur now this is the same species but what's spectacular about this one is you can actually see ammonite fossils on top of it so these would have died and fallen to the base of the seafloor and just settled on top and that's why we can see their imprint across the bones here so here's a portrait of Mary Anning herself holding her hammer but wearing traditional dress which I just think is fantastic. Then above this plaque is a cast of a pliosaur. Now Mary Anning didn't find this even though it looks like she did with the location of the plaque so don't get confused if you do visit the museum. But this cast is based off of a specimen that was found at a Yorkshire mine a year after her death in 1848. Now it was displayed by the mine owner for a few years before it was gifted to Philip Crampton who arranged for it to be displayed in Dublin in 1853 during the British Association for Advancements of Science meeting. Now it remained in Dublin for nearly a decade, however eventually there was increasing concern that the structure protecting the fossil wasn't doing a very good job anymore, so it was then relocated to the Royal Dublin Society Museum. It was here that it could be scientifically studied and also for Henry Ward to take the cast that he then would sell on. Now these casts would fetch around $150 fully painted. Now that was in 1866, so you can imagine that in today's world, these would now be worth quite a few thousand. Now only five casts survive today and most are hidden away. However, the one in the History Museum of London, you can see in it's the main object of the fossil where you cannot miss it. It is humongous and you can even touch it. It's the one specimen that's not protected by glass. So the real bones of this specimen have been located and we can see in this wonderful footage that Dr. Dean Lomax took at the National Museum of Ireland 
that they are in pieces. Now this is because in 1877 the Royal Dublin Society Museum was incorporated into the National Museum of Ireland and there was then, you know, collections were being moved over the next few decades and in order to move this specimen it was broken up with sledgehammers for ease. And so it's one of those that hopefully in time it'll be pieced back together and the original spectacular pliosaur found in Yorkshire can be put back on display in one of the wonderful museums. But for now, you can go and see a wonderful cast of it in the London Natural History Museum and other casts can be found. I believe there is one in the Smithsonian Museum that went on display. So you can see them dotted around and in themselves, they are a wonderful piece of history. So let's now move on to Mary Anning's first plesiosaur fossil that she's found. Now here we can see her initial sketch that she did put into a letter to actually announce the discovery of this new fossil animal. Now we can see from this sketch that it very closely resembles the actual fossil itself. So we can now see here the specimen of the fossil that is on display at the London Natural History Museum. And you can see her detail in this sketch and she's put notes with it as well to really like announce and explain what she's found. Because Mary Anning, she had a limited education and she was self-taught with a lot of what she knew. Now she had limited exposure to books and literature and a lot of it was, you know, handed down to her or borrowed. And this is how she got a really complex education of fossil reptiles. She would also dissect modern animals, including both fish and cuttlefish to get that better understanding of the anatomy of the fossils that she was finding. Now this is incredible work to be so self-taught in a time that there was just no formal education for these women and she became so highly recognized for her knowledge that even in an age where women weren't respected for you know their academia or their work in science she still was making a reputation and her fossil shop itself was getting a reputation so if she was a man she may have made even greater moves but considering the time she was in I think it's extremely impressive that we're still stood here chatting about her today. That's all we've got for you in today's episode, but we're going to now head to a very fun department that I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with, down where the dinosaurs go. So let's go check them out.